What is the Schomburg Center? To me, it is home. The place where we come to see who we really are, not just somebody else's reflection of who we are. The Schomburg Center is a place of culture. It's a place of history. 
It's a place of knowledge. The Schomburg Center, to me, is a repository of all of the things that has documented our sense of worth as a people. For me, that means that it is a place of immense power. The Schomburg Center is a public research library and a cultural institution. For the study of the Pan-African world, it is perhaps the best in the world. My Schomburg Center is Arturo Alfonso Schomburg. Arturo Schomburg said, Black history and culture and intellect exist at a time when most people didn't believe that. He collected those evidences. And that became the beginning of the collection. And it has expanded and has grown to where it is now a world-class institution. It holds over 10 million items. There's no parallel anywhere that brings to light what we as people of color have done, what we continue to do. Black culture is all of culture. The universals that animate everyone's life happen here for all people. The Schomburg for me is one of the center pillars of Harlem. When I started the journey of finding out about Red Rooster and Harlem, the very first place I went to was the Schomburg. Researchers from around the world come and use what we have here. I could not have written just about any of the books that I've written without the Schomburg Center's archives, resources. The Schomburg Center is much more than a library. We encourage lifelong learning and exploration. The Junior Scholars Program is a Saturday program with students from fifth grade to senior year in high school to help them learn about black history and culture. Learning about my history is important because it teaches me who I am. The Schomburg Junior Scholars Program is going to do nothing but uplift them. So many talented and brilliant people have walked the corridors of this amazing institution over the years. From Octavia Butler to Toni Morrison and James Baldwin, Ella Fitzgerald, Alvin Ailey, and Harry Belafonte, who graced the stage in this room of the American Negro Theater. This place evokes great memories. It was a gift to us in our community to really try to find that space to reflect expressions of black experience. I just knew that the environment what I saw these young African Americans doing it was a place I needed to be. What is my Schomburg Center? I'm standing here at the Cosmogram, which underneath holds the ashes of the poet Langston Hughes. On the evening when this Cosmogram was dedicated, people began to empty out of the auditorium. A jazz trio struck up. And to my amazement, Amira Baraka went over and asked Maya Angelou for a dance. And they started to dance on top of the Cosmogram, on top of the ashes of Langston Hughes. And I felt what a fitting way to kiss the memory of Langston. The Schomburg Center is a research institute and a library, but it's so much more than that. There's something going on every day. So many amazing people come here to talk about their creative craft to share what inspires them. The Schomburg Center's collections help to tell stories even beyond our walls. The Schomburg Center is here in this exhibition at MoMA, One Way Ticket, Jacob Lawrence's Migration Series. We depend on the resources of the Schomburg to enable us to tell this story. Thinking about the implications of the past on the present is absolutely crucial for understanding the next steps, understanding what we have to do to go forward. We today have the responsibility of making sure that new artists and activists, new scholars and poets know that this place continues to be a resource and a source of inspiration for the work that we must continue to do. The Schomburg Center is knowledge. The Schomburg Center, to me, is education. The Schomburg Center is home. It is family. It is foundational. The Schomburg Center is inspiration. The Schomburg is with me in everything that I do. Community, inside and out. The Schomburg Center is us. The Schomburg Center is you. And we invite each and every one of you to find your Schomburg Center. Good evening. I hope everyone's well tonight. Welcome to the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Cultures program, Writing for Black Activist Lives. 
I'm Deputy Director Casey Matthews of the Schomburg, and on behalf of our director, Joelle Bivens, our staff and volunteers, thank you for joining us for this next edition of Conversations in Black Freedom Studies. I'm coming to you from Harlem, USA, and encourage you to use the chat to let us know where you are this evening. I have the pleasure of introducing you to the series co-curators tonight, Robin C. Spencer Antoine and Jean Theo Harris. Jean Theo Harris is one of the co-founders of Conversations in Black Freedom Studies. She's a distinguished scholar who focuses on civil rights, black power movements, and the contemporary politics of race in the United States. She's the author of the widely acclaimed biography, The Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks. Her award-winning book has been adapted into a young adult edition and a documentary for NBC Peacock. Robin C. Spencer Antoine is a historian whose teaching and research explored black social protest after World War II, urban and working class radicalism, and gender. She's the author of The Revolution Has Come, Black Power, Gender, and the Black Panther Party in Oakland, which was published in 2016. Robin, over to you. Good evening. Thank you so much, Casey. It's great to be here. Uh, we start our 11th season of Conversations in Black Freedom Studies. Kamozi Woodard and Jean Theo Harris started Conversations in Black Freedom Studies in collaboration with the Schomburg Center a decade ago to create a space where the public could engage with new works and Black social movement history. With fewer and fewer public spaces to engage with new work in Black history, Conversations in Black Freedom Studies was conceived as a way to hear, to learn, and to discuss new works in Black history that can help us see the present more, more clearly. In many ways, Conversations has gotten to chart the expanding field of Black Freedom Studies over the past decade. And tonight's conversation provides another iteration in that ongoing expansion of amazing books and literature. Kamozi took on a more emeritus role. And two years ago, I stepped into the role of co-curator. We celebrated that history in our 10th anniversary last month with a wonderful conversation and reception in the building. We're so very pleased that the Schomburg Center has continued this series as one of its educational and public programming offerings. We're also grateful for all of the people behind the scenes, especially Lucien Baskin, who's our outreach and social media coordinator for, for the series. Please follow us at Schomburg CBFS or at our website, blackfreedomstudies.org. Now on to you, Jean. You might be muted. <laughs> would think I would learn. Um, welcome to this conversation tonight. It feels particularly urgent. Obviously, we're in a moment of an incredible backlash across the country against the teaching of history. Um, today, with the news out of Tennessee and the expulsion just a couple hours ago of Representative Justin Jones for standing with young people, our conversation tonight feels particularly urgent as we consider the long history of Black freedom fighters, their lives and vision and work, and what it has meant and taken to document them. We are so very delighted to be together for this timely conversation. That has been the goal of Conversations in Black Freedom Studies since its beginning. In many ways, the history we need to see the present more clearly. This recording will be available afterwards on YouTube, so please share it with people who might be interested in catching up. And now I'm delighted and honored to introduce tonight's panelists. Their books are available in the Schomburg shop online, and we'll put that link in the chat as well as in the bookshop in Harlem. Shanna Benjamin is a professor of African American Studies at Wake Forest and the author of Half in Shadow, the life and legacy of Nellie McKay. Dan Berger is professor of comparative ethnic studies and associate dean for faculty development and scholarship at the University of Washington at Bothell and the author of Stayed on Freedom, the long history of black power through one family's journey. Shauna Redman is professor of musicology and African-American studies at the University of California, Los Angeles and author of Everything Man, the form and function of Paul Robeson. 
and Patricia Romney is a leadership and co joy coach with her own firm, Romney Associates, and the author of We Were There, The Third World Women's Alliance and the Second Wave. Welcome, all of you. Thank you so much for joining us. So we wanted to begin tonight with each of you telling us briefly how you came to this what commitments or questions guide your work? And let's start with you, Shanna. Thank you for that question. And um, I just want to echo the sen Robin's sentiments earlier about thanking those who were behind the scenes to get everything off the ground. And I'm just really grateful for the opportunity to be here. So, you know, I came to the story of Nellie Y. McKay, who was a professor of African American studies and literary studies at the University of Wisconsin Madison, also my graduate school advisor. And when she passed in 2006, we learned that the things that we thought we knew about her life, we really didn't. And so I think I came to this project because I was first and foremost curious. I wanted to know why she had withheld information about her age, why she had not disclosed that she had once been married and had children, and why she introduced her daughter to her colleague as her sister. Um, so I think that when I imagine kind of one of the greatest concerns that I was thinking about, and it has to do with how to render the lives of Black women um, who are prone to secrecy, who are often uh, misrepresented, who are hyper-visible, invisible, misrecognized all at once, how to render her life with the kind of detail and depth that I thought it deserved. Um, and so also as her former student, how to have the um, appropriate distance, while also um, understanding that our closeness gave me a really powerful, powerful perspective on the way that she impacted not just the scholarship, but also the mentoring of young faculty like me. So I think that, um, you know, I, I didn't really know what I was doing. And so I found that it was really difficult to figure out how I was going to be guided and what sort of commitments were going to become the thread that ran through the book. Um, so a lot of it was about exploration, writing myself into ideas and concepts. And what I centered on was the kind of book that incorporates not just bio, uh, biography, but also incorporates memoir. So there are these vignettes that set up the chapters as kind of a counterpoint um, where I write about myself and my experience as a scholar and as a graduate student. And it was really powerful for me um, as an exercise in understanding to lay my narrative beside McKay's and to think about the relevance of her story even today. Yeah, well, I want to um, also echo my my thanks and gratitude for everyone who makes this session happen, not just tonight, but the whole series. And and I'll just say that, you know, this, my book, State on Freedom, would not have been possible without the support of the Schomburg as well. Uh, and a fellowship there in 2019 was really uh, wonderful and, and foundational to the book. Um, and like uh, Shauna, my, uh, my book is also... Uh, sort of in dialogue with a former uh, teacher of mine. So State on Freedom is a biography of Black power organizers, Zahara Simmons, and her ex-husband and, and lifelong friend, Michael Simmons. And I met Zahara when she started at the University of Florida the same year I started there as a freshman. Uh, and I, you know, right away was just very blown away by hearing some of her stories of her time in the movement. It was very inspiring to me to, to, to go to the library and check out everything that I could about sort of civil rights and Black power histories at that time. Um, but more than that inspiration, I was sort of struck by the difference between her stories of Black power and what it was about and its emergence 
and the, the written record uh, of what Black Power was. And so that has always sort of stood out to me as I, you know, uh, read other people's scholarship and writing, and then as I as I started to do my own, um, and and getting you know to work with with Zahara as a young student activist, and then later uh, meeting Michael and, and and getting to work with him uh, in different ways was sort of struck by the fact that they both are still very involved, uh, and so the fact that you know the story of Black Power is often reduced to a particular organization or a particular time period always just felt unsatisfying to me. And so State on Freedom was an attempt, is an attempt um, not only to tell their life story, but to tell the story of Black power as it stretches across geographies, time periods, and strategies. So I want to thank also all of the workers who made today possible. Thank you for all of your labor, the curators, the technicians, the thinkers, creatives. Um, and just a correction, I'm faculty at Columbia, and I want to mark that because 2023 is actually the 100th year anniversary of Paul Robeson's graduation from Columbia Law School. So it's a formative year in that institution's history, whether they mark it or not, that remains to be seen. It may be up to me to do, but just to announce that um, there is a significance to this year in the ropes in kind of legacy. I'm also speaking today from Philadelphia and I want to acknowledge the native and indigenous keepers of this land, all of the free and enslaved workers and communities who make this place possible. Um, and made it possible historically. Philadelphia being the place where Paul Robeson lived the last 10 years of his life. So that brief kind of situating might give you some sense of how I'm always encountering him. He is everywhere I go. Um, and this is something that absolutely animated my return to him in Everything Man. So I might mark the most formative moment of engagement with him in my dissertation with in my graduate career when I wrote about him in my dissertation, which became my first book anthem of which he's a featured troubadour. But my story of engagement with him actually begins in college as a 21 year old. One of the black faculty on my campus, a small liberal arts school in the Midwest, made it his mission to ensure that every black student on campus knew the name Paul Robeson. And it was not a name that I had known before. Um, and he actually went so far as to invite Robeson's granddaughter, Susan Robeson, to campus to teach a course about him. And she taught a film course solely focused on Robeson's um, filmography. And as a 21 year old, I did not pay as much attention as I should have, but I knew the name going to graduate school, which is saying quite a bit, considering what um, I later would come to understand as the reception to his life and legacy in the moments after his retirement in 1963 or, you know, the decade, the 15 years prior to that as well. So I, I think part of the story or the moral of my story of how I came to him is really trying to mark the importance of people telling stories every single day, telling stories that are important to them about people who were formative to collective struggle, but also very personally touching the lives of so many folks. And in the process of telling those stories, exposing all of those people in communities who are lost to or erased from knowledge regimes. And in the process, knowing them as such, right? We were not being taught about Paul Robeson in our college aside from this guest visitor. I was not hearing his name in high school or in the media or any other form or fashion by which I came to understand myself as a thinking person. And so it was really important to me to actually be able to return to him again and again because I did see and hear him everywhere. So I didn't know that I would come back to him in the creation of Everything Man after writing about him and Old Man River in Anthem almost a decade ago. I had no intention of coming back to him over long form, even as he became my favorite subject in that project and someone I continued to listen to and sit deeply with. But he was tapping me on the shoulder 
at most every turn, visual exhibitions, sampling that I was hearing, um, lines of his that I was seeing repeated as memes and in social media. And I certainly didn't have um, any plans to write a biography. And I don't think I wrote a biography, although it's not not a biography either. So I was curious about this person, curious about all of these other elements of how he appeared to me. And so tracking him and chasing him around the world became the next project and a great, great adventure. Well, I want to add my voice of thanks and appreciation to all of the folks who helped to put this evening together. Uh, I'm calling in from uh, Massachusetts, but as a young high school student in the 1950s, I spent a lot of time at the Schomburg, the old Schomburg. I haven't yet gotten to see the, uh, the new beautiful place that we saw in the film, but it meant a lot to me and my learning. So I came to write about the Third World Women's Alliance uh, when I was on the faculty at Hampshire College. Uh, I spent 20 years on the faculty at Hampshire and at Mount Holyoke uh, and began that work um, then. And it really came, um, began in the 1990s when I had a lot of young women students, mostly white students, who were studying uh, the women's movement. Their parents, you know, they were that era where their parents had been involved in the women move, women's movement and they were very interested in doing work in that area. And so they would, um, as I sat on their various committees, um, they would bring all of this information about the, the women's movement and I would read their, their lit reviews and I would say, and I said to them, well, what about women of color? You haven't uh, you know, mentioned anything about women of color in that moment. And they said, well, there weren't any. Uh, so that really shocked me because I had been a member of the Third World Women's Alliance, which is the group that I write about in We Were There. And I, uh, you know, it, it just kind of threw me back. Uh, I became aware that one of the reasons they thought that uh, is that Bell Hooks in her uh, first book, uh, she really later changed her perspective on this and gained more knowledge about it. But in her first book, she um, talked about how black women were silent uh, during the era of women's, uh, the women's liberation movement, the women's rights movement, that they were afraid to, to stand up and to speak out uh, about sexism among their own folks. So that was what started me uh, to think about doing some writing about the Third World Women's Alliance. So I began to do my own research to follow up on the work that the students were doing and I found that there really wasn't very much at that time. If you look now, there's a great deal more that's been written. Uh, but in the mid 1990s, there was very little out there. Uh, and so I determined that I was going to try to tell the story. What I did find was either incomplete or in some cases inaccurate. Uh, one of the things about um, the Third World Women's Alliance is that it was a uh, we had our approach was intersectional and the group was, you know, we would talk about BIPOC people or people of color uh, and the language that we used in those days was third world. We were aligning ourselves with the countries of the third world in Latin America and in Africa who were rising up uh, and throwing off colonial powers. And we saw ourselves as oppressed uh, in the United States in small internal colonies uh, in the United States. So uh, I wanted two things, to mention and to really bring forth the work that the Alliance had done around race, sex, and uh, capitalism, Those, that intersectional intersectionality, which was not well known at the time, uh, about that anyone had done that work at that period of time. And I also wanted to expand the vision of the Third World Women's Alliance. Many people knew the work of Francis Beale, uh, who written some uh, works about being black and female, but they didn't know about the many other women in the Alliance who'd gone on to great leadership uh, positions and who also represented uh, diverse communities. It's important, I think, at the, the Schomburg to uh, acknowledge and remember verbally that Arturo Schomburg was a Puerto Rican, a black Puerto Rican man. Uh, and the Third World Women's Alliance was composed of black women uh, African-American descent, West Indian descent, um, 
Puerto Rican women largely in New York and more Chicanas in the California branch. But I wanted to bring forth that, that intersectionality. And I wanted to respond to the students' need to know more about uh, the history of Black activism. So that's how I came to, to begin that work. Oh my God, I've done this twice tonight. I, anyways, thank you so much. I I think this conversation for me is particularly, feels particularly on point because obviously I also have been thinking a lot about biography and I loved um, Shauna and I'm so sorry I misidentified your, I knew you were Columbia and somehow I just, yeah, anyways, but this idea of finding our subjects everywhere and I feel like I find Rosa Parks all the time everywhere. Um, so this is the point in the conversation where you get to teach us something. Give us a window into your work, into life writing, into the person or people that you're writing about. What insights do you think your subjects lives, you know, give our audience? How does the genre of biography or life writing expand how we think about the Black freedom struggle, what we know about it? in terms of history, but also today. Uh, and Dan, why don't you go first? Yeah, thanks. So, you know, the State on Freedom just came out a couple months ago, and so I'm still, you know, uh, really in the e evangelical phase of, of, you know, this method being, being the, the way to go. Um, but I, I really think that biography helps us understand right, the, the long durée, right, the, the long arc in ways that so often histories, particularly of activism, tend to narrow to these specific time periods or specific organizations. Um, so so to, to give a brief example from the book, um, you know, Zahara and Michael, the people at the heart of State on Freedom, uh, were both members of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Uh, Zahara was a, had been a project director during Mississippi Freedom Summer, one of the few uh, uh, black, one of the only black women to be a project director. Um, and then she stayed in Mississippi for another 18 months after Freedom Summer. Michael uh, went down south later from, from Philadelphia, um, first to Arkansas and then a campus traveler um, for SNCC. But they met in Atlanta. Uh, when they both were sort of pushing SNCC to adopt a statement against the U.S. war in Vietnam. And what ultimately, what caused SNCC to release that statement was the murder of a Navy veteran and SNCC worker, Sammy Young, in Tuskegee, Alabama in January 1966. And when, uh, after Young was murdered and SNCC released that statement, you know, many sort of, uh, conventional institutions, politicians, media were furious at SNCC. And they asked a young Julian Bond, who had been a SNCC member, just elected to the Georgia State House of Representatives, if he agreed with the statement. And when he said yes, the state legislature refused to let him take his seat. And Jean, you alluded to this in the introduction, but given what just happened in Tennessee today uh, with the expulsion of Representative uh, Justin Jones for sort of siding with, with demonstrators, um, you know, saying no justice, no peace, and so forth, right? This history is still, is still very much with us. But when Julian Bond was denied his seat, SNCC formed what's called the Atlanta Project of SNCC that uh, Zahara, who was then named Gwen, was the co-director of, and Michael was a member of. And in a lot of civil rights histories, the Atlanta Project is kind of the villain um, and is seen as sort of the bad guy of, of the story. And what part of what, I do in State on Freedom is, is tell a different story about the Atlanta Project, uh, which not only succeeded in re-electing Julian Bond to it because when he was denied his seat, it automatically went to a special election, but also was organizing tenants and uh, domestic workers uh, in the uh, Atlanta area and famously uh, doing anti-war organizing. And so, Michael and 11 others were arrested at a demonstration outside the Atlanta Induction Center in uh, August of 1966, you know, after a period of, of several, uh, you know, anti-war, anti-draft demonstrations. And they were arrested on August 18th. They were tried and convicted the very next day. Um, and they were sentenced to, uh, to prison at the Atlanta prison farm 
which today is the very same grounds that the city is trying to make into a, a $90 million police training academy that's been called Cop City. And so, you know, part of what I wanted to do in State on Freedom was to tell a human history of what it means to be an organizer and to go through, you know, not only the political heartbreaks, but, uh, and, you know, the political sort of loves and, 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 and heartbreaks, but also the, the personal, right? And what does it mean to, to do that as a, as a person? What is the toll of that as a person? Um, but so much of the story is still with us, right? So much of the sort of power um, institutions and confrontations still define our present. And I think that's very much a part of the story as well. That's being stayed on freedom is an ongoing project. So I, I absolutely agree in thinking about how biography allows a capacious story to be told kind of through the stories and life ways of individuals. Um, I think too, part of my investment in writing about Robeson or what I ultimately came to in the study and writing of Robeson for this project was really the ways in which singular people become multiple. And I think this too is what Dan is suggesting, right? Particularly for people who are very much identified as organizers, identified as political life world creators, right? As Robeson was considered by thousands, if not millions of people over the course of his 40 year career. And so I was really pleased to chart in the book, the ways in which he was an amplifier, not for himself and his singular kind of frame of dreams, but for communities all over the world. And so I say in the book that Robeson is less subject than opportunity. He becomes an opportunity for me to understand how ideas travel, to understand how people do whatever it takes to get to their people, to get to their communities. And this is especially poignant in his story from 1950 to 1958 when his passport is revoked after having built a phenomenal global career for himself that was as much based in appearances in rallies and on the Spanish battlefront and in real time face to face conversation with people as it was built through his Hollywood career and his concert stage career. And so really chasing him all over the world in that effort to understand how he became multiple in all of these different places and all of these different times was really significant for me, both in thinking about the shape of biography and what it can look like and what it can do, but also for thinking just about political strategy. He was an amazing, amazing strategist. And I don't think he gets enough credit for that in part because culture is so often sidelined in our discussions of what it takes to win. What it takes to win is music and art and dance and all of these things that so many people have illuminated for us, but is so often kind of made peripheral or background to the kinds of movement histories that we often tell. I also was wanting to really forward how capacious our opportunities are for the forms of our writing. And so I mentioned earlier that it's not a biography but it's also not not a biography. I wanted to actually think about Robeson thematically so the book does not proceed linearly. It proceeds in a series of vignettes, I think similar to what Shanna was talking about in relationship to Nellie McKay, right? That I was coming to him through encounter. And so it was not a straightforward history. It was actually episodic in all of these different ways. And I wanted to stay true to his ability to appear, to manifest, to be summoned in all of these different ways. And so the first chapter of the book is thinking about him as holographic um, and thinking about the voice as his means of travel, particularly during these moments of travel restriction, of domestic, um, basically incarceration, right, domestically and also after his death, how his voice travels well after his death and is meaningful, deeply, deeply meaningful to the people who use it in struggle, but also deeply, deeply frightening to the state, to global surveillance apparatuses, all of these things, right? And there's power in that, that is more than just the straightforward story of him having been here and gone. It's actually about 
methodology. It's about shape and form and conjuring and all of these more mystical, magical elements that I think he believed in and manifested for all of us. And in the process of this, because I think some people anticipated a biography, I had an occasion or two where people were concerned about me leaning towards hagiography, right? Where I was being too laudatory of this individual. I was spending too much time thinking about sentience and thinking about sound and the heart and love and all of these other things that as Robin Kelly and so many other people have showed and told us should actually be our political method. We have to lead with these things. And I make no bones about that in the book. I love this person. And I think it's important that we manifest those things in the form of our writing and storytelling, because that's how people were living and experiencing the world with them while they were here. And so in that way, I'm, I'm proud to take on the mantle of hagiography if that's how it's read, but there are no lies in the book at the same time. I'm going to take us back a step or two before I um, wrote the book. We were there, the third row women's lines in the second wave, uh, to talk a little about how I discovered the importance of telling um, and exposing people to Black activist lives. I created a course when I was teaching in Hampshire called The Psychology of Oppression. And drawing on my Third World Women's Alliance experience, it had sections that dealt with racism, uh, sexism, and classism. And it was a very popular course, very well received. I saw a lot of growth uh, in students uh, as they took the course. Uh, and, you know, all was good. A few years uh, after I began that course, uh, I decided to connect with Robert Cole, who was a literature teacher, and we created a course called Black Autobiography. And um, not so it's narrative, not so much biography, but uh, autobiography. And uh, what I saw happen to students in the course of teaching that really um, strengthened my commitment to tell the story of Black activist lives. Students felt empowered uh, when they, you know, rather than talking about oppression, talking about racism, which is important to talk about, learn about, which they have experienced, right? Um, to look back at the lives of people, you know, we began with early writings uh, of women who were enslaved, right? Uh, and went all the way up through the mo through modern history. And what, you know, white students were saying, I never, I mean, things that were so surprising to hear. I never knew that Black people went to college. I never knew that Black people were educated during slavery. Right? That, so that was one kind of experience. Black students were, began to feel empowered. They were uplifted. They were encouraged. They had people that they could identify. They were uh, reading stories and um, being shown ways in which people had become activists early in their lives and continued that activism uh, through their lives. Uh, you know, talking about um, people like the Big C, reading books like the Big C, reading uh, Angela Davis's autobiography. So many things that really helped them to envision themselves uh, as activists. And in the process, coming to see, feel is kind of what, what um, Jen has, ta has just talked about, the kind of intimacy that you can feel, the knowing of somebody personally, the connection of the mind and the heart uh, in reading the life stories of, of Black activism. So that was kind of how I, um, I came, uh, came to the work. And what I think is so transformative about reading and writing books that talk about black activists and activism and people and the lives of black activists. So I have to say that um, 
I know I'm supposed to be like looking at the camera and paying attention while everybody's talking, but I'm taking notes and I'm just, there's a part of my heart that is just longing for the conversation after the conversation. When, you know, after we've had a chance to answer the questions, we go off somewhere, you know, and we're just gathered, huddled around a table, just chopping it up. So I just wanted to say how much I am thoroughly enjoying um, just listening to these reflections because I think when I was writing, I felt really, I feel I, I felt kind of isolated and alone because many of my colleagues weren't working within this same genre. And so, you know, I was hearing over and over the same things about hagiography, like how are you going to write this book? And this is your advisor, this is your mentor. But, you know, I started to think about these genealogies of influence. And, you know, one of the ways that I frame the book is thinking about um, family history and thinking about um, the way that during family reunions, when I was a kid, we would always have this reading of the family history and you needed to know who and whose you were. You needed to understand the connections. You needed to come together. There needed to be a gathering to commemorate and to memorialize, to remember, and to just come together. And, um, you know, you can't forsake the fellowship. So in painting this genealogy of influence, I think that something that was really important to me in the work, and I'm really taken by these ideas of how we bring our subjects forward into the present. And we tell these stories in a way that they become relevant and necessary. And so I think, for example, about how McKay, um, her experience in graduate school, because we get these narratives about what life is and what it's supposed to be like when you're a graduate student, the experiences of Black women in the professoriate. And I just found that there were lots of conversations that seemed to reproduce old narratives. And I felt like there was a price that had already been paid, whereby folks of my generation and beyond should not have to apologize for certain things, should be able to claim space in certain contexts to have a seat at the table. Um, and so looking back and documenting McKay's life and her experience at Harvard um, was really important for me. And I'll share a little bit of that story now. So when McKay went to Harvard, she was a 39-year-old uh, uh, single mother. And she was there, she didn't have much money and she was having a really, really hard time. She didn't let on. Um, it, but while she was there, she met um, now a painter, of course, with whom she corresponded for nearly 30 years, but also Arnold Rampersad. And so when she's having a hard time trying to figure out, you know, what am I going to do? I, I feel like I need to leave. Um, there are faculty members, you know, nobody believes that there is Black women's literature, there were these black women in Boston at the time and they came together to talk about the literature and they would they asked, where are the women? What about the women? And so McKay actually took a leave of absence from Harvard and went to Simmons to teach. And it was there teaching at Simmons that she developed her pedagogy, that she made connections and that she brought a lot of the spirit of liberal learning, the work of uh, practitioners at small liberal arts colleges back to Harvard and then to the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And I think what was really important for me um, was understanding that there is no one way to live a life there is no one way to have a career. And in thinking about the narrative that McKay adopted about herself and her life, how that enabled her to put boundaries around those things that she wanted to keep private, but then also to create circumstances where the focus would be on her work and not on her personal life. That kind of intention with the goal of 
contributing to the liberation of young Black minds. In her application material, she was shaped by the uprisings um, at Queens College, where she was an undergraduate, where she went to night school. And she felt that young Black and Puerto Rican people who were a part of the SEEK program, as she had been a part of the SEEK program, needed the kind of information that she could get as a faculty member and that she could convey in ways that they might not have seen in their classrooms. So I think it was really transformational for me to imagine how she still defines our present and how this freedom making comes in the way that I was able to shape her narrative that considers all of the different ways that she engaged with those she cared about. Oh, I'm loving this. Um, and I I agree um, for me to this idea of writing like a life sometimes feels so isolating and the kind of the notion that like, right, if you're like, we're doing hagiography and certainly for me as well, like 15 years plus, I love Rosa Parks more than ever. Um, and just feel like her lessons and what she gives us for today just is so rich. And so that's where I wanted us to turn now. Um, these are these are hard times for practitioners of Black history. And yet Black history has never perhaps been more essential to an understanding of our nation's past, our present, and certainly where we're going from here. So what lessons for our times, for our struggles today, for activists today can be drawn from the life story that you tell? Uh, and Shauna, let's start with you. I, I think in the life of Paul Robeson, one of the most presently urgent and most obvious elements of, of his legacy today, his political legacy is, is anti-fascist effort and um, like deeply committed anti-fascist work all over the world. Um, and pointing out the fact that it's not something that simply happens over there, right, somewhere else. So yes, he's, as I mentioned, known for having sung on the battlefield during the Spanish Civil War, right, where he literally on the battlefield stilled the hostilities between the two camps who both paused to hear him sing in 1938 but also his anti-fascist activism and work was present in 1951, where he handed to the representative at New York City's UN office, a copy of We Charge Genocide, right? And those are the kinds of moments that define his engagement with a broad pantheon of minoritized, oppressed, hunted, disappeared kinds of people and communities. And so the anti-fascist effort on his end, which he was not only participating in as an activist, but also theorizing in his writing, writing for Spotlight on Africa through the Council of African Affairs, right? That he was doing all of this work to actually bring to common language fascism. We have to call it what it is. We have to name it often and we have to rage against it. And he was absolutely perfectly committed to that over his lifetime. Um, so I think that's one of the most urgent and pressing evidences of his political life in the present. And also the fact that there are many defenses mounted against it, right? It's in the scholarship. It's in the intimacies of connection between individuals, between organizations who are developing their own fronts against the onslaught and expansion of fascism. It's about the creatives who are making work every single day in response to the ravages and consequences of large scale and small scale fascist aggression. Our arsenal is legion. And he demonstrates that I think more than anyone else I can think of in the 20th century. And we can fight about this if we have to, <laughs> but that's my position and I'm sticking with it. So, you know, he foretold a lot of this and gave us a lot of opportunity to think deeply about what strategy could mean and look like in the present. And then the other thing that I would say about his resonances is really about the methodology by which he lived in the world. And I would say that 
one of the things he most thoroughly demonstrated in my mind is the fact that impact is more about consistency than spectacular feats, right? I think so often in this social media age, we're looking for the person who is doing the most fantastic activist kind of triumph that we can possibly imagine. And that's the person who's kind of exalted as exemplary of the movement of which they're part. When in fact, Paul Robeson demonstrates that it's really about staying put. It's about being present all the time. That is what it takes to actually move the world forward, right? He has a famous line where he says, um, I'm paraphrasing, but um, you know, that his politics, his beliefs are immovable to one thousandth of an inch. He was not going to budge on any of the things he believed in, any of the communities that he fought for. He would not sell people out. And that caused some tension in his career, right? There were people who wanted him to speak about certain certain evidences of his political beliefs, certain changes with the global weather that they wanted him to speak to without giving him due credit for having been a thoughtful strategist in deciding when and where to speak to those changes and to speak to those beliefs. And so it's about showing up for the people who need you in spite of all odds and consequences. And he perfectly models that. Really uplifting and encouraging to hear you talk about Paul Robeson. You know, the We Were There is not about an individual, it's about an organization. And I do do about um, 20 vignettes of women who are members of the organization. And one of the, the lessons that I hope people will take from this is that um, you don't have to be a luminary. It's kind of what you were talking about in terms of consistency. You know, you don't have to be a luminary. You don't have to be a, a household name in order to work to make societal change. Uh, I think that's one of the key things that I was trying to, to talk about and write about in the book. These women were working class women, right? Uh, none of them were major scholars. They were not coming from upper middle class and middle class families. They were not, you know, some of us were college graduates, but not all. Um, nobody was at that time in, in graduate school, now that I think about it, there were a couple of women who uh, began with us who were in medical school, um, but they, all, everyone coming from working class uh, families. And so, you know, there's this beautiful African uh, proverb that says, every time a person dies, a library burns. And my wish in this book was to tell the lives um, of the women that I knew the work that I did and to uh, with them and the work we all did together and to make sure that that little library that I've been involved with didn't burn, right? And so I often encourage um, you know, students to do writing about their own lives, to write about their family members, their grandmas, you know, uh, writing about mentors. You have such a good example of that, uh, of that tonight. And I think the other life lesson that um, stands out for me in my work is the importance of continued struggle, right? Uh, you know, we talk about la uh, luta continua, to continued struggle. That, and I demonstrate in the book how these women who, this organization uh, folded in 1980, right? Uh, we're now in 2023. And every one of the women who are who were part of that organization are still involved politically in so many dimensions of their lives. And it didn't end when the Alliance uh, folded and when the Alliance closed. So, you know, continued struggle. And the other example, we had a expression that we used a lot in the Alliance and um, it was written a lot about in our newspaper, Triple Jeopardy. And the expression was live like her. We had a, a beautiful picture of a Vietnamese woman uh, and under it was a big uh, caption that said, live like her. And part of what I was trying to do in this book was to give people examples of the many ways in which women in the Alliance made change as a group and then went on as uh, physicians, Mer Melanie Turvalon, who uh, wrote about and created the concept of cultural humility. Many other people went on to do 
work that they could um, uh, emulate, right? That they might pattern themselves uh, uh, after. So the idea of living like her uh, and giving people models whom they can emulate was another important uh, life lesson that I hope I was able to demonstrate in this in this book. So yeah, I want to draw forward some of the ideas um, that folks have talked about um, the importance of staying put, um, the power in living an activist life that doesn't um, necessarily read in the way that we typically think of um, activist lives. Um, and when I think about McKay, some important things to know um, include the fact that she only wrote one uh, single authored monograph in her career, that she was not a prolific book writer, as it were, um, she wrote very important essays. She co-edited the Norton Anthology of African-American Literature with Skip Gates, um, but she wasn't performing um, in a way that a lot of her peers were, um, the life of an intellectual. She had a hard time with that at the end of her life and actually had a friend call her while she was at home recovering from chemo. And the first thing she said when um, she picked up the phone and she heard his voice and she said, I never wrote a second book. And he said, Nellie, I didn't call to ask if, you know, why you didn't write a second book. I'm calling to check on you. But what she didn't appreciate at the time, but one of the things that I really wanted to draw out in the book is that it's important to think about activism in terms of your unique and particular skill set. McKay was particularly deft in navigating institutional politics. And she had a way of getting what she needed for her graduate students. She had a way of getting what she needed for her department. She had a way of getting what she needed from the Ford Foundation. And so she used allyship. She used the power of community. She used the power of vision and insight as a way to live an activist life. I think also about um, the fact that she stayed at the University of Wisconsin-Madison for her entire career. So at the time she was at UW-Madison, there were lots of folks who were moving from institution to institution. Colleges and universities were looking for um, someone to head their Black literary studies. Um, this was really a burgeoning field before McKay and others, while Black literature would have been taught at historically Black colleges and universities, not necessarily so until Black faculty ended up at predominantly white institutions. And so there was quite a market to have a Black faculty member who's also teaching Black literature at your institution. And so it afforded a great deal of mobility and opportunities for individual advancement. One of the things that was really important for McKay was that she, um, that she was sure to, uh, she made sure to lift as she climbed. Um, and so when she was thinking about the editorial board of the Norton Anthology of African American Literature, um, there was a time when there weren't any um, Black women on the editorial board. And she made sure that there was open and equal access for Black women to be part of that project, to make sure that they had an imprint on how Black literature was being shaped, this idea of canon formation, and how we then reflect on the long arc of Black literary studies. So um, I really think that one of the greatest lessons that I learned was that it's important to use whatever skills I have at my disposal and to be sure to step up and to speak out 
in the interest of those who need to have access to what I readily have access to in the same way McKay did that for her students and her colleagues. Yeah, I, I really love what everyone has said uh, so far. One thing I want to pick up on was, it was what Pat was saying that, you know, you don't have to be a luminary to, um, to fight for, for social justice. And I think that's a real inspiration for, for State on Freedom, right? That, you know, here's a biography of two largely unheralded uh, organizers. And I think the more that I worked on it, the more clear it became that, you know, most social change is made by people that most others have never heard of, right? <laughs> um, and and that we lose a lot when our when we narrow our attention to who gave famous speeches or um, or these kind of particularly you know famous events as, as important as those events are and as important as those speeches are. Um, and so I think you know looking from the perspective of grassroots organizers who have remained involved over their over their long political lives really emphasizes that people continue both both that sense of of consistency and continuity in the struggle but also that 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 consistency and that continuity requires asking new questions as things change right that you know organizations may come and go but but how are you how how am i still involved in the fight for freedom right and so you know state on freedom follows you know from two people from from SNCC to the nation of islam to uh, to sort of local fights for black studies at, at universities, to um, to sort of prison organizing, to the Republic of New Africa, and on and on and on, right? And I think that sense of building new coalitions as you learn more about the world is so important, right? Both Sahara and Michael talked about, you know, in the civil rights movement, the FBI was sort of uh, you know, a, a begrudging presence of safety against local sheriffs, or at least that was the idea, and learning that that actually was not true, right, <laughs> right? that you couldn't count on the FBI, that in fact the FBI was was often, you know, cooperating with or assisting uh, those sort of local sheriffs, right, that that's a realization, that and, and that realization causes you to act differently, right, <laughs> causes you causes you to sort of make, make a change as a result, um, and so I think that, you know, recognizing that, that the fight is a long one and not a not an easy one um that it takes place over multiple organizations and campaigns right but that it's always that effort to to build new coalitions right to sort of bring bring new people together where an emphasis on freedom education is always at the heart of it right so much of what both of them have done across a wide variety of organizations has begun with or otherwise involved a freedom school as the basis, right? So that people can, you know, learn a sense of, of themselves, of who they are, and and have a sense of empowerment moving out into the world, right? And and that's not just a narrow sense of empowerment or narrow education, but is about culture as as Shauna is so so beautifully reminding us of. Um, but I really the, the last thing I'll say uh, about all of that is that we we tend to talk a lot and have this kind of romantic idea about speaking truth to power. But I think one of the profound innovations of Black power is that it's actually about power. <laughs> so it's not about speaking truth to power. It's about building and exercising power. And that's a different thing. Thank you. Um, and just to pick up Dan's point about new questions, we are almost to the part of the evening where we take your questions. So please start putting questions in the chat and then uh, we'll go over to you, Robin, for our last question before we get to audience questions. Well, I've been behind the scenes with so much to say. <laughs> so I'm happy to be back. What a great, great, great discussion. Thank you so much for, for your work, for your insights. Um, for all of it. We're joined by hundreds of people all around the country and the world. If you were able to read the chat that's happening in YouTube right now, you would see that there are people from Bronx, Central Florida, Harlem, and all over the country and world who are listening in. A special shout out to the activists in the books who are in the audience as well. I know you're out there. I think I saw Zahara Simmons commenting. Uh, there may be members of Third World Women's Alliance and all the others vibrating at other frequencies like Robeson and, and McKay. 
I also want to remind our audience that we need your questions and comments in the chat. Of course, this is such a rich discussion that there's so much that's been brought up for us to um, to dive into. But just a reminder, if there's something that's burning um, your mind, you had a curiosity, uh, please do take a moment and uh, put that into the chat so that the speakers can engage with, with your ideas. Well, my final question is about the audience, right? About you all, right? So our audience is filled with teachers and learners of all kinds. Can you introduce us to one individual outside of your main characters, or if, you, if you're writing a collective biography, choose one of them, um, or one event that you've encountered in your research that you think more people need to know about? What would you shine a spotlight on, um, given that you have uh, these three minutes to, to bring us in? And we can start with Patricia. Yeah. Well, thank you for that, for that question, Robin. I, I want to shine a light on Dr. Vicki Alexander. Uh, who is a member of the Third World Women's Alliance uh, branch in Oakland, California, uh, the Bay Area chapter. And Vicki graduated from the University of California at San Francisco Medical School in 1974. At a point in time, this is pre-affirmative action, pre the Bakke decision, who are a handful of uh, Black students in the medical school, an even smaller uh, number of women in the medical school. And she went on to um, to graduate very successfully and to go later to Columbia to complete her master's in public health. Vicki began some work in the Third World Women's Alliance that she continued, she has continued throughout her life. Uh, the work she began was, uh, um, she founded a coalition to fight infant mortality in Oakland. Uh, as you know, the numbers of uh, still today uh, the high numbers of uh, rates of infant mortality among Black women are just staggering. She began that work in 1978 and went on to um, continue and build that work as part of the structure uh, in Berkeley and in Oakland uh, and created an organization called Healthy Black Families, uh, which really dovetailed with the work of the Black Infant Health Project. And still today, she was president of that organization or uh, a director of that organization for many years. And she's now on the board uh, of the organization which works to, to promote uh, black parent infant um, health and viability. Vicki was part of the Rainbow Coalition. She worked with the Center of Constitutional Rights. She worked with the Reproductive Rights National Network. She's worked with Planned Parenthood. She's got more awards than I can name. Uh, you know, Madam C.J. Walker Award and a MLK Life and Achievement Award. But what's really important that I really want to shed a light on about Vicki is the way in which her focus on maternal child health in the Black community has lasted for over 50 years and still going. Yeah, so I too want to take up a moment. Um, and what I want to do is talk about this moment when Nellie McKay was on the tenure track. And it was, um, it was 1980. And she was busy trying to get done everything that she needed to get done in preparation for tenure. And so she was moving forward her Jean Tumor manuscript. She had written an essay on being a black woman at a white university. And then she was struck with this idea. And this idea was to conduct an interview with Toni Morrison. And so at the time, it was 1980, and Toni Morrison had just won the National Book Award for Sula, but she hadn't written Beloved. She hadn't won the Nobel Prize. And so this was a very different, well, different for the general public, um, a different Toni Morrison for the general public. But I would say that the Black women who read her literature knew exactly how important she was. And so McKay approached her review chair with this idea. And he said, no, I don't think you should do it. Um, I think it's a distraction from the real work that you're supposed to be doing to fulfill the requirements for tenure, to demonstrate excellence in research. Um, you know, she listened, but she did it anyway. And I just really appreciated this moment. I remember being in the archive and coming across a photocopied um, memo 
from Morrison to McKay on Random House Stationery, where she agrees to participate in the interview. And then in her accompanying letter to Nell Painter, she contextualizes all of this um, in light of what her review chair has told her. And for me, I think it captures the incredible risks that Black women were taking at the time, uh, Black women scholars were taking at the time to center the lives and literature of Black women writers and just how important it is to pause and to remember these moments so that we don't take for granted the kind of work that we're free to do now because of uh, the risks and the sacrifices that were made in order to create a foundation for the study of Black women's literature and lives, but also for the biographies that are written about these same scholars. Uh, you know, um, Michael Simmons likes to joke that he, and the same is true of Zahara, uh, is the, the Forrest Gump of the Black liberation movement, that they just were, were sort of there at the right time and, and were around, you know, all these people. So the book has so many, you know, cameos from Alice Walker to Louis Farrakhan to Malcolm X to Coretta Scott King. It's, high, it's hard to choose uh, someone to, to highlight, but I, I just want to say a few words about Bill Sutherland, uh, who was a sort of revolutionary pacifist who was incarcerated as a conscientious objector during World War II um, and engaged in, this, in sort of, uh, protests and organizing against segregation of prison facilities before Zahara or Michael were even born. Um, but in the 70s, uh, had, had moved to first Ghana and then uh, in the 60s and then Tanzania to be part of the different independence movement, national liberation movements in the African continent and then started working with the American Friends Service Committee and their Southern Africa program, which uh, Michael Simmons was the um, director of, uh, and, and Zahara sort of worked with uh, as well, just as a sort of anti-apartheid activist. And, you know, Bill was, was a sort of advisor and key figure in Southern Africa summer, a sort of 1978 effort to sort of train uh, students in anti-apartheid organizing uh, around the country that I think really helped um, seed the victories of the anti-apartheid movement in this country in the uh, early 1980s. And I think Bill is just such a great example of someone who has stayed on freedom his whole life uh, in a way that took him all over the world um, and that he sort of continued this kind of intergenerational uh, freedom tradition that brought together a wide range of people and projects that are usually kept far apart. Yep. Similarly, I mean, there are a lot of people who I would draw out. I have to mention Islanda Good Ropes, and, um, who was his life partner and has been beautifully written about by Barbara Ransby. Um, I was going to talk about Leon Theremin, the uh, Russian inventor who created the instrument, the Theremin, which I offer as a teaser at the end of the book after having taken lessons myself and what that instrument meant to Robeson's career, um, an instrument that began as surveillance and what kind of ironies are drawn out in that relationship. But someone who came to mind who actually is not in the book, but I've written about elsewhere is a man named Bill Brown L, who was an incarcerated individual at Marion Federal Penitentiary in 1977, which is a year after Robeson passes away. And there's correspondence in the Howard archives where he was in conversation with Paul Robeson Jr. about establishing a Paul Robeson Memorial Month at the prison and wanting Paul Jr.'s permission and buy-in from local playwriting and theater companies for this kind of production at the federal penitentiary in which he established a Black History Month quiz that had a number of questions, actually exclusively questions about Robeson's life and legacy. There was a draft of the quiz in the archive they filmed The Emperor Jones, his film from 1933, which you can imagine if you know the film about a Black man who escapes captivity, what that meant for these incarcerated individuals to see that film in 1977, but then also organizes a petition campaign amongst his fellow incarcerated peoples in response to 
what was then a very controversial play based on Paul Robeson's life by Philip Dean Hayes, and one that had actually garnered such skepticism and criticism that their petition in Marion was meant to be in tandem with what was an international petition that was signed by Maya Angelou, James Baldwin, Harry Belafonte, all of these people taking out full page ads in New York periodicals in response to the kinds of slanderous representations of Paul Robeson's life that they saw in this stage play, which originally starred James Earl Jones. And so I want to lift this person up, Bill Brown Ellis, again, one of these unsung, unnamed people who are intersecting deeply with the life of Robeson, with the kinds of resonances that he was producing. You know, um, Nelson Mandela tells a story of having listened to Robeson records so often at Robben Island that they warped, right? So he has been in prisons before. He's been um, familiar to these imperiled people before, but this was someone who took it upon himself to mobilize around this legacy, to change the conditions under which they were living. And it's just another um, part of the evidence for his ongoing presence. Thank you, thank you. Uh, those were fantastic answers. Uh, before we dive into the audience questions, I wanna acknowledge again, you, our audience. I think we have some students out there, students of life, but in particular students of Dr. Berger uh, who are here to watch their professor talk and, and speak and uh, learn from him and everyone else. So I wanna acknowledge the uh, students out there before we turn to the audience questions. Uh, there are a couple of questions that we, what we have, and um, I'm thinking that what I wanna do is perhaps read a, a few of them together to put them out there as a whole, and then you can uh, hold on to the ones that, um, that resonate. This way we get uh, everyone's voice into the record. And I may sneak in my own question there too, because I mean, as I said. Okay, so Heidi Ramirez wants to know, um, in addition to dedicating courses in Black Studies and Activism, how and where uh, might you imagine leveraging learning like yours in K-12 public school education, right? So the question is about bringing this kind of knowledge to K-12 education by Heidi Ramirez. We heard the word joy in uh, introducing Pat Romney this earlier today, and we have a question about joy from B. Rickett. The sustained commitment and strategizing leads them to think about the community care and joy needed to balance the resistance. How did scholars and activists maintain community fellowship and create joy? And then the third question about um, visions of liberation that extend beyond the borders of the United States. What does internationalism mean to the people that, um, that you write about? And um, I hope that's not too much, but I want to get those out there and, and see see how we could get the conversation started. Anyone is free to jump in with, with any, any, you know, any of those questions. Well, I'll go ahead and say a few words about, um, speak a little bit to the community care and joy question, um, and just say that it was incredibly important to McKay and her colleagues and her comrades that they cultivate these spaces of care and joy. And one of the ways that McKay did it was by throwing parties. And she was known for these parties. They were champagne soaked, um, wonderful food. And she was a great cook. And she frequently had people over to her home um, to just sit together and talk and enjoy the food, enjoy good conversation. I had a chance to participate in one of these kind of on the periphery when she had a party celebrating the publication of the Norton Anthology of African American Literature. And I remember Wanda Coleman being there. I remember Barbara Christian. Um, I remember Deborah McDowell. And I just remember all of these people that I had just known as um, names in a book. 
finally being in their presence and having a chance to see how they interacted really established an important model for me um, that I am very, very careful to make sure that I enjoy myself along the way and that I continue that tradition of making sure to carve out space where I can enjoy my colleagues and an extended network of friends who are invested in this work. Very well said. I would add to that, that, um, you know, I think about and talk about joy, borrowing uh, Adrian Marie Brown's concept of emergent strategy. I think joy is one of the emergent strategies um, that we have and the tools that we have uh, to advance liberation. And we can't do it without joy. And my colleagues were talking earlier about the importance of culture, of art, of music. All of that is, is really uh, fundamental. I'm thinking about uh, the four pivots uh, and the way in which uh, the concept of flow is introduced in the four pivots. So we have to stay in joy, in, particularly in black joy, uh, when we think about activism through music, through dance, through togetherness, through parties, um, through any way that we can to keep our eyes focused on liberation, right? It's not the focus, as I said earlier, kind of relating to my course on the psychology of oppression. Okay, that's important to understand. Oppression is important to understand, but our eye has got to be stayed on liberation and we can get there through remembering to practice joy and to live in joy. Yeah, I, I love that. And I would just say uh, uh, on the joy piece that, you know, researching state and freedom, you know, covered a lot of a lot of difficult topics of, you know, experiences of of, uh, of apartheid, of sexual violence. But the, the telling of it, the, the, the relationship that that Sahara, Michael and I had with each other and developed in the process of doing the book also had a lot of joy in it right that, that there was a lot of laughter and joy and celebration in in just writing the book and telling the story that became the book um mm -hmm. that i am certainly reflecting on a lot as a historian and, and what it means to do this work um i just want to say a little bit about internationalism because i think that that's really important and you know i i think the emergence of black power within SNCC was internationalist from the start uh, and I think that that continued to be the case that, you know, Pat talks about the Third World Women's Alliance and why they called themselves that um, in the state on freedom. I, you know, the, the last third of the book is a sort of globe trotting journey uh, that goes to India, that to Cambodia and Vietnam, to Jordan and Palestine and Syria, uh, to Hungary and the former Soviet Union and former Yugoslavia. Right. So um and that was a black power consciousness, right? That was a black power project of what it means to fight for liberation with oppressed people all over the world. And I think that's something that black power really emphasized uh, and that and that certainly has carried Zahar and Michael through their lives. I'll just say briefly and quickly on each of the questions. Um, the K through 12 question is a real one. This too is, is our contemporary moment where all um, kinds of protective knowledges for minoritized peoples is under assault, right? And I take it very seriously. And I think with someone like Ropes, and there are many opportunities through which one might be able to sneak it in. Um, although I'm, I'm rapidly against the sneak, right? I want us to be bold in our assertions of the significance of these people. But I do think, again, this is one of the things that culture may afford us in our curricular activities and our pedagogy that other forms of activism might not, right? So what would it mean to read Ballad for Americans um, for your students, right? And to dig in on that song right, and to expose a whole world through a rendering of that cantata, just one opportunity. But considering this moment, you know, there's a tremendous number of schools that are named for Paul Robeson, actually. And if we took him seriously, those names would be strict, I'm confident, right? And so I think there are opportunities in that way to think about the built environment. There are opportunities to think about, about um, resonance in ways that would 
I believe, sp spark student curiosity in ways that would do a lot of the work for you, right? If we just open the door and let them walk through it, even when those doors are meant to be slammed shut and nailed shut, right, under the current political circumstances. And I'm, I'm very much um, sympathetic to that kind of work and, and hope to be of service in that way also. Just briefly on care, I think part of it is really remembering to announce what we're for, not just what we're against, but what we're for and sharing with people what you love. And through that love, we come to all of these other ways of knowing one another, of being in conversation and communion with one another that are no less political than the strategy sessions, right? And so just insisting upon that, what do you love? What, what kinds of introductory moments can we have with people that we're entering into struggle with such that we get to know them better and know them as an individual, right? Not as an autonomous unit in a mass, but as a person face to face. And I think, this is what is sometimes lost in this moment of, you know, biopolitical uncertainty and things when we can't do face-to-face -face organizing in the same way, but we have to find some way to connect on a person-to-person -person level. And then on internationalism, I mean, that's Robeson's life. As early as 1934, he was identifying as an African, not an African-American, but as an African in print. And these are the kinds of worlds that he was trying to create, right, where the borders were not an arbiter of relation, that they were actually just one more, one more hurdle to cross. This is why he was a grand linguist speaking and singing in more than two dozen languages, right, that radical internationalism was always central to how he understood himself. It's how he became an honorary Welshman. It's how he got to Bandung in 1955, even when his passport was revoked. There are all of these ways that he used technology to get through to his communities around the world because he was that committed to insisting upon that community as his and that he also belonged to them. And I think there's something really loving about that effort and again, the consistency of it. Thank you, thank you. I wanna acknowledge um, Gwendolyn Zahara Simmons who's thanking everyone for listening and is uh, in our audience as well. I had a quick question about the resistance and persistence that is oftentimes part of these life writings of individuals, of, of couples, of organizations. Um, I'm sure you faced that as you went through uh, your your research. I'm sure you may have faced that even on the professional level because quiet as it's kept, biographies have uh, vexed relationships with the academy and are oftentimes not welcomed or valorized in the same way as other types of, of writing. So I just wanted to throw that out there as a provocation to thank you for persisting in the face of that and bringing these important, very, very important stories um, to light. So I wanna to shift to Jean, which I think um, will be our final comment for, for the night, if there's nothing else. What a wonderful conversation. I feel like we could go on. There's so much more to, to think about, to talk about. Thank you, all of you for being with us, our audience, our panelists, our behind the scenes tech people. Uh, we are back next month on May 4th, Thursday, May 4th. We're always here on the first Thursday of the month during the school year. Um, we're going to be talking about the politics of religion and the role of Black faith. And we will be talking about Black Muslim faith as well as Black Christian faith. And we will be joined by Melissa Ford, Tani Thomas, and Suad Abdul Kabir. Again, this is on YouTube, so you, please share it with friends. Uh, you can all, see all of our programs on our website, blackfreedomstudies.org. Please follow us at Schomburg CBFS and have a safe and wonderful evening and we will see you in May. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.